Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Attention Please podcast, this time on video. So the stories for today are Taliban wins over Afghanistan. Not that that was a surprise. And India celebrates 75 years of independence from the British. So both these stories actually have a common hook. And that traces to um, Plato's skepticism of participatory democracy. This is a topic that I've covered in my podcast before, but for those of you who are listening to it for the first time, here it goes. So Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher, uh, was skeptical about democracy as it was practiced in Athens, and which has come to become the bedrock of the modern Western concept of democracy. This is one person, one vote, and um, everybody participates in the, demo in the democratic process. So, Plato's criticism of this was that just like you do not, uh, when you have a disease, you do not go and ask a person in the street and about like say 100 people in the street, what problem do I have? And then take a majority vote and then decide to um, abide by that decision. You go to a doctor, you go to one doctor, or maybe you go to two doctors, but you go to specialists. It is strange that perhaps the most important um, factor of our lives, which is how our nation is ruled, is left to non-specialists. It's left to the non-elite. It's decided by one person, one vote. And his objection to it was that the people who get elected are the, those who play to the basest instincts of human beings. They promise things which they know they cannot deliver and they spread fear and hatred of other people. And hence what Plato wanted in his ideal regime was ruled by the elite, people who have been trained to rule. Now, this, this conflict between uh, the Western concept of democracy and what democracy normally becomes um, has, has been a conflict in democratic societies since the time of Plato. Now, why am I talking about this in the context of India celebrating 75 years of independence? So when India became independent, most people, most uh, reporters and media people and historians said that India did not have a chance uh, to keep itself united as a country. And there were examples of what had happened to the Ottoman Empire, to, to different uh, large conglomerates of nation states that had been put together before World War I and World War II, and people had seen how they had disintegrated in Europe. And it was expected that India was going to go the same way, that there would be feuding between the different communities and the different religions, and India would essentially balkanize itself. But that hasn't happened in the past 75 years. And the success that India has had as a nation far exceeds what anybody could have predicted 75 years ago. So why has this happened? Well, if you, ask people, people, at least many people would say, whether they would couch it in these terms, I don't know, but they would say that it is because of Nehruvian elitism, that what you have is essentially uh, what we typically have had has been uh, platonic, even though, and, and, and I'm coming to that, even though the facade of one person, one vote is maintained, but what we really had is Nehruvian elitism, where a group of patricians rule. Um, we call it the Luttians crowd or whatever you want to call them. But there's a group of patricians who rule. And they're all Western educated, English speaking. They're very similar to each other. They follow the ideals of Western liberal democracy and they rule. And democracy, there is a choice. You just simply get to select which of the elites you choose. So you either choose somebody from the Nehru family, or you choose Vajpayee, or you choose Advani, or you choose Inder Kumar Gujral. So again, your choices are choices between individuals, but they're not choices between, they all belong to the elite, to put it simply. Now, this kind of rule, it was governed by classical Western liberalism, you know, strong aspects of socialism, and socialism was important because socialism enables these elites to maintain power while also lining their pockets, because without lining their pockets, they cannot maintain power. 
And by doing so, they also maintain the facade of democracy or free choice. But it's always like a magician, it's always a loaded hand. You pick one of them. Uh, you don't get to pick everyone. Now, an example of this kind of elitist democracy has traditionally been, and you, you might think I was going to point to India at this point of time, but no, the US. If you US, if you look at the way politics has been run, it's been always been run by very similar people, mostly lawyers, lobbyists, with very similar background. Um, and that's the way US has traditionally been run. And you know, the example of, of an elitist would be Joe Biden, uh, Kamala Harris. I mean, these people are belong to that, the American version of the Lutian circle. And it's always been that in order for a nation state to work properly, power has to be within the hands of these people. Now you can ask the question, how do we know that they're fit to rule? How do we know that they're the elite? And again, the reason why they have been the elite is because their parents have been the elite. If you look at even US politics, if you look at Indian politics, there's a strong, strong aspect of hereditary power. So it is in many ways, just one step removed from the old concept of monarchy, which we in India are very, very well aware of. And we have been under monarchs for centuries. So this is one model. And many would say that India has survived um, because we have adopted this form of elitist government. Now they're not gonna say it in this way because if they say that they're elites, then, then that kind, kind of ruins the facade that this is democracy. So again, they will not say it like that, but that is really the underpinning of the whole idea of India. Now, the other alternative is the will of people, which is true participatory democracy, where the people who come up as rulers represent the opinions of the people. If the people want something, they will give it to them. So examples of them are, let's say, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the US, Trump. So Trump speaks the language of the people. If the people want something, he will say it. He does not care if it meets the standards of classical Western liberalism or not. And he will say it not because he believes in it. This brings us back to Plato's criticism of democracy. He will say it because it enables him to get elected. And that's exactly what you see in American democracy today, where you see that the Republican party is just mortally scared of going up the, the classical elite within the Republican party, it kowtows to Trump because Trump has established that kind of direct participatory democratic power, which nobody else in the Republican party has. Nobody has that kind of fan base to use a word that we all know, but the whole notion of creating a fan base is a concomitant of true participatory democracy. It's the same way that we vote for Indian Idol. It's the, exactly the same way that we vote for our leaders. It's the person who we like, who echoes our opinions. So in other examples of people who, who represent true participatory democracy are over here in Narendra Modi, Yogi Adityanath. And that is why there is an immense amount of disquiet um, among the elites with respect to Modi and Yogi because they recognize that they, they represent a very alternative form of democracy. This is exactly the form of democracy that Plato feared. Now, the elites um, often say, again, they don't say it in this way, but they often point to Pakistan, Afghanistan as examples of failed states. And this is a good point to point out because they actually went and did true participatory democracy. Now I know there's an irony of calling Pakistan a democratic country, but they basically caved in to what the majority wanted, right? Which was to establish a majoritarian Islamic state. So in that case, in, in that respect, it was, it represented the will of the people. And they would say that, you know, because these, and, and this is true, these states are radical because the people want them to be radical. This is an important point that often is not hammered enough. It's not that when democracy comes to Pakistan, if Pakistan becomes a liberal democracy, no. Because in Pakistan, the, demo, the people actually want a, a state, which is what Pakistan is. So it's not that people want this fundamental nature 
of the Pakistani state to change. They may want a personal change. They may want Imran Khan or they may want Musharraf. But again, they don't want to change the essential nature of the Pakistani state. Now, and this comes to what we see today, the fact that the Taliban rolls into Afghanistan with, within days, what does that say? A few weeks ago, Biden was saying that there are 180,000 Afghani troops armed to the teeth, trained by the US, there's just 75,000 Taliban troops, what are they going to do? And of course, this, this again, it, it, with respect to America, there is of course malice, and then there is sheer ignorance. And I will put this to ignorance from Joe Biden in the absolute lack of understanding of what the ground realities are. This is not the first time that the US have, have been absolutely ignorant of the way the countries outside the Western world work. So over here, of course, what Biden is saying, and of course, this is an embarrassment for him because he just said this a few days ago. And we see what has happened today is that there's this fundamental presumption and they believe it. Biden wouldn't have said this if he didn't believe it himself because he would be caught out. So it was not that he was intentionally lying. We know today that you know everything he said was wrong is that they kind of think based on their Western perspective, based on that elitist Western perspective that people in Afghanistan actually do not want the Taliban that the Taliban is an external force which comes in and for the last 20 years, infrastructure has been built to protect Afghanis from the Taliban. That's absolutely not true. Taliban represents the will of the people. That's why they just walk into the cities without any, of course, there is intimidation true, but you can say that the Afghani army also has enough firepower to resist the Taliban. It's not that they even fight. They just lay down their weapons and walk away. And if you've seen the videos, if Taliban rolling into Afghani cities, it's not that people are coming out as resistance to resist them. They're coming out and welcoming the Taliban. So Taliban represents in Afghanistan the will of the people. That is participatory democracy. Yet they don't have elections. They just walk in and, and point up the barrel of a gun at you. But the fact is that most people there actually support what the Taliban does. And so that, and, and at that point of time, if you look at the history of Afghanistan, if you look at the, you know, when you, have, you often see pictures on WhatsApp of how Afghanistan was in, in 1970s, when there was the king, Zahid Shah. And in those days, it was exactly, the, it had Nehruvian elitism in Afghanistan at that point of time. There was a group of people, there was the monarchy, and it's the exact same story with the Shah of Iran. It's the exact same story with Basa, with, uh, with Saddam Hussein. It's exactly the same story in Syria. So there's always been, and they're all hereditary, by the way, always ruled by a group of elites who have uh, socialists, have, have, so, have socialist antecedents. They do play with, they, they do play strategically with religious fundamentalists in order to keep their power. All of them are corrupt. All of them are authoritarian. And yet they somehow keep the peace. So Afghanistan used to be a peaceful place. Syria used to be a peaceful place. Iraq used to be a peaceful place till the harbingers of true democracy, the Taliban and the ISIS came in. So the point that I'm trying to make is that and this comes back to India, is that many people will point to Pakistan and say, this is what happens if you do not have an elitist system in power. This is exactly what Plato said. And there is a counter to that, which I also find interesting. And again, I, I personally don't have a strong opinion on any of these. I think these are both valid points to talk about. And maybe the truth, like everything else for a centrist, is in the middle of it all, is that that, it, that the comparison isn't a comparison worth making. We are not Pakistan, we are not Afghanistan. That there has been a syncretic, pluralist, uh, tradition-based culture that has always existed here in the landmass of India. That when, while that doesn't mean that there won't be conflict between groups, it still means that there isn't really a, an idea, strongly a strong idea that is part of Indian ethos which defines us versus them. That's perhaps the important thing, which is why 
Hinduism in the classical sense has never been a religion. It's been a set of traditions that have been handed down. And this is why India has always welcomed different cultures. This is way before Western elitism, way before Nehru. There have been wars and battles, but everything, all influences in India have been absorbed. We've never broken down as a country. We have various ways, our culture, our traditions have absorbed and have kind of created a cushion um, when, when friction has arisen. So I, 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 I would say, a, a, I wouldn't say contradictory, but an opposing school of thought says that India is the way it is because of this pluralistic Sanatani or Hindu, whatever you want to call it, but inherently Indian tradition of pluralism that has existed. And that it did, doesn't matter if it would have happened without Nehru too. Again, we wouldn't know because again, history chose Nehru, history chose Gandhi. By the way, Gandhi's model of secularism, Gandhi's model of tolerance was more on the lines of this Sanatani idea. That's why this, if you look at the, if you look at the debates between Gandhi and Nehru, Nehru was more like everything we have is thrash. Let's go and let's adopt the British Western Russian model and let's use it in India. Um, let's have universities, let's have dams, let's have, and, and, and again, there was, there was definitely something worth there. And, and, and I know it's very fashionable to diss on everything that Nehru did, but it's not true at all. Of course, Nehru brought with him socialism, um, a, a direct line that goes to Rahul Gandhi. And that may be worse. It, you, you can't have any worse legacy than that, but I'm kidding here. But it's also true that Tehru did, did start institutions, strong institutions in India that have persisted to the day. The, and this is important while we are talking about 75 years of the modern Indian state, the fact that the military has stayed away from politics. We can see from our neighbors that this is not something which can be presumed to be an axiom. It's definitely not. Um, and the fact that this has happened, the fact that we have had a system of IITs and AIMS and that we have focused on education that has allowed us to be a participant in the knowledge economy, I would say there is definitely, uh, there is definitely a contribution of the Nehruvian vision, which again is anchored in that Western elitist mindset. It does not tally with Gandhi's more traditional, let's go back to our roots kind of developmental model, which was more in line with that kind of participatory democracy that used to be in Athens, where you have like village communities who decide that's that, that the local communities decide what happens. And Nehru's objection to it was precisely that if you let communities and villages decide, then it will become majoritarianism that there will not be any progress, that the always people will choose stasis as opposed to progress and moving forward. So again, I'm not saying that there is any good solution to this, but I think that it's interesting and important to look at these competing models of democracy and try to think of what actually works and which one is good. I really don't know. I would, again, at one point of time, I didn't used to think like this, but now after doing a lot of reading and, and, and perhaps maturing, I realized that they're, they're two distinct, the two distinct paths that India could have taken. India chose one path, and it was not that if it taken the other path, which was a more traditional path, we would have been worse off. We will never know. But it is also true that, that nations that have had this kind of elitist ruling class haven't actually done very badly. Um, so the, this, this democracy is a solution for everything. And when I say democracy, I mean democracy as is written in the book. Most places don't have democracy as is written in the book. It has a quasi autocracy, whether it is in the US or whether it is in India, that there is always a ruling class who rule. And whenever somebody from outside that ruling class comes and becomes the ruler, then there is disruption, then there is oh my God, the idea of India is disappearing, intolerance is rising. That is when the elitist power structures, and it's not just one family or one political party. Elitism is built into the power structure, and that's when the power structure pushes back. So um, thanks a lot for this uh, listening and perhaps seeing this, uh, this video podcast. Uh, let me know how you liked it in the comments, and um, I'll wait for the next week.
Thanks a lot and bye bye. And by the way, subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's the only way this video will be found by other people. So it's very important that you like and you subscribe. And also, it's good for my ego. So thank you, everyone.